Just off Route 78 in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, you'll find signs pointing to various sites around the Wachong Reservation. Seeing one pointing towards a deserted village will surely strike the interest of many Hometown Tales viewers. The name alone conjectures abandonment, mystery, and intrigue. It is no surprise that the location is also surrounded with urban legends of a haunted water tower, a hermit's house, and other occult activity. Europeans first settled the area in the early 1700s. In 1845, David Felt bought the property and a mill along Green Brook. He also created a village surrounding his plant that included homes for his workers, a post office, and a general store with a church above it. Well, we, we know that uh, he supposedly ruled with, a, with an iron hand. He had, uh, he had curfews set down. He had a, a bell on top of a a barn that would ring out to tell people when to wake up and when to go to work and when to go home and when to go to bed. He was sometimes referred to as King David. Around the time of the Civil War, Felt would close his plant and the village in history would record the line, King David has left and the village will go to hell. It's very likely that Felt had strong business ties to the south um, and with the secession occurring, it's uh, very likely that he saw, uh, he saw the path ahead as being a rough one and wanted to consolidate his business interests back in New York City, which he did. Felt ends up bankrupt in 1872, and it's not at all clear that the village has anything to do with that, but uh, it is an interesting fact nonetheless. The property changed hands several times after Felt left. Even though the village was never really abandoned, a journalist searching for a story wrote an article that glamorized and romanticized the mysterious community. Feltville then became known as the Deserted Village. Probably the most important source is an article written by a Boston newspaper woman named Elizabeth Shepard, who uh, actually wrote some pretty interesting stuff in the late 19th century. She appears to have visited the village in 1880 or 1882, somewhere in that area, and um, wrote her article and had it published in 1885 in a Boston paper. The uh, title of the, of the article was somewhat romantically, The Deserted Village and she then goes into a description of Feltville in which she describes Warren Ackerman as using the village for uh, a variety of different purposes, agricultural mostly, and, and that he was probably going to develop into a resort eventually. So it's clearly not deserted. Even by reading her own article, you can see that it's not deserted, but it still has that kind of spooky, sort of romantic um, feel to it, and, and that name is just sort of stuck, despite the fact that uh, if the village had been deserted, deserted for any more than a few years, probably there wouldn't be much left of it. Many of the structures from the village still stand today. You can see the strange mix of Adirondack banisters on the simple cottage structures. This is a result of Warren Ackerman turning the town into a resort community known as Glenside Park in the 1880s. The Union County Park Commission purchased the area in 1916 and still maintains it today. So, of course, there's folklore surrounding the village. For instance, the idea that David Felt ruled the village with an iron fist and was an obsessed ruler living in grand mansions while the workers slaved may not be totally accurate. He, he brought these people here from the tenements of New York City uh, to, to work in his factory, but he provided a, a great life for them. Uh, the housing was tight, but it was out in, in the open country. Uh, he made sure that people had everything they needed available to them through the general store. And he had a church where he compelled people to go to church every week, but he provided a minister to, to watch after the spiritual needs of the people. Matt Tomasso, the associate director of the Center for Archaeological Studies at Montclair State University, has been studying Feltville for years and went looking for Felt's Grand Mansion. It was sort of embarrassing for me for the first few years of this project because I wanted to find this mansion that was mentioned in the history books and I couldn't find any, any trace of it. So I started questioning whether there have, had ever been a mansion here at all and whether Felt himself had ever lived here and found as I started looking through the early documentary record that in fact uh, there really wasn't that much to go on. Uh, as it turns out, I found an 1847 newspaper article about the village and that article 
talks about Felt's summer residence, summer house, okay, not a mansion. With that in mind, I came back looking for a much smaller building, much smaller foundation footprint. And in 2003, we were actually able to locate his summer house. In uh, 2004, we're going to do some excavation on it and see, if, see whether it turns out to be a mansion or just a summer cottage. There are also stories about the old cemetery on the hill. Is it haunted? Do the spirits of those buried lurk these woods? Maybe, but probably not in this cemetery because there's no one buried here. If you were to dig up underneath those stones and somebody has tried it, uh, you wouldn't find anybody home. The actual cemetery is elsewhere. Uh, we believe there were maybe as many as two dozen people buried there. We have a pretty good idea from a map where it would be, but we don't know who's buried there. Other ghost stories don't totally match up with the facts either. Well, we, we actually run a haunted hayride every year, a very popular program. One of the difficulties of putting on that program is that we don't have any really good ghost stories to tell. There, there are stories, but they've all been disproved over time. Uh, there, there is a story of a 12-year-old girl, don't know who she is or what happened to her, but supposedly she died and was buried under the porch of the building uh, right next door, right behind me. When we restored that building a few years back, we had archaeology work done. We dug up everything under the front porch. She's not there. And how about the mysterious hermit who lived outside the village? The thing that, that you don't hear in that urban legend is the fact that he had a family whose kids went to school and uh, that he was actually working for the town that, that owned this property at the time. So he was really anything but a hermit. Um, we actually did some excavation on that property in 1996 and found toys that, that his kids used which he probably bought at a store, I would imagine. Just beyond the village in the heart of the reservation stands an old water tower with a truly dark history. As with many bizarre stories, it starts in the 1970s when a local teenager, Greg Sanders, murdered his parents with an ax, then climbed this tower where he leapt to his death. Dan Bernier was the last man to stand on the tower before the stairs were taken away. The water company had workmen there actually removing the tower, taking the stairs off the outside of the water tank, taking the deck off the top. They had already removed about the lower 40 feet of stairs. They had a, a ladder up against the tank and they, they told me I'd be welcome to go on up if I wanted as long as I climbed the ladder. So I climbed this, this tall ladder and got off onto a, uh, what was left of the staircase a little creepy climbing to the top because they'd already taken the, the fencing and the railing off, so you're climbing a staircase that gets you higher and higher up to the 100-foot top of the tower. But the whole time, you know, you're looking over the side, it's straight down. I was the last person on top of the tower. The rest of the Wachung Reservation is filled with tales of satanic and pagan rituals in the forest and on the hilltops. But after talking to officials, it is most likely just kids drinking in the woods and vandalizing rocks with spray-painted pentagrams. There is no doubt that the roads along the Wachung Reservation can be creepy at night, but for real tales, stop by the deserted village during park hours. You'll get a glimpse into four centuries of history. Well, we, we encourage people to come here any day during daylight hours. Uh, we try to keep uh, a little box up there stocked with a self-guided tour brochure that will lead you around the property and tell you the history of the place. We all sort of pull together and work together and try to, try to do what we can to, to bring this information out into the public and to, uh, to preserve these sites so that future generations will have information that they can, that they can learn about and, and research that they can do on archaeological and historical projects. Uh,